What about on the other side of things, where, you know, the relevance of just the medical culture itself, these things that might be, you mentioned, can change over generations and slowly shifting over time as we you know, go through the years. What are those pieces of culture that you can see as being like important? Well, when we think about physician wellness, we also think about how our profession of medicine is changing and the culture, the professional culture is also changing. And some have described different eras of medicine. You know, in one description, there was the, you know, before the 1900s, it was so awful to be a physician then that, in fact, suicide was understandable for a physician to consider because there was very little treatment at the time. You may be the only doctor for miles and miles. So it was really, it was awful. But then there there was this golden era of medicine and from the 1900s to maybe 1970s, where there was an explosion of treatment options. And that's where the status of physicians changed. And um, there was much more prestige. Uh, And so to even consider suicide at that point was completely out of the norm. Um, But then there was a change in the modern era afterwards, where we started saying, you know what, physicians are humans. They're not superheroes. So we need them to be more human, more vulnerable, yet. There was still the expectation that remained that physicians are still superhuman and that they will continue to stretch themselves out and have no boundaries when it comes to the work. So that's one way to to think about how the profession changes. But there have been really interesting articles recently from Tate Shanafelt in the U.S. and his colleagues about the professional culture of medicine. And they're talking about uh, well-being 1.0 and well-being 1.2 or 2.0 rather. And here are some of the shifts they describe. So I think they really hit it on the nail here. You know, from like a, a godlike kind of position as a physician, we've now transitioned to only being a superhero or a hero to essentially now being human, right? Let's let it, that's a, a positive change. And a human that has limits, a human that's vulnerable. So that's like one of the shifts that you see in those three types of eras. There's a change in terms of work-life balance, right? From being completely selfless and completely dedicated to your work life and to the profession, shifting in the middle to saying, well, we need, okay, let's let's have a better balance here, work-life balance, and probably pushed a bit by more women coming in to medicine, more young parents working and juggling. But balance wasn't necessarily the right word yet. Now we're really talking more about work-life integration that's you know the the more appropriate term um and then perfectionism right going from this view of of perfectionism not being able to ever make errors we're now shifting to recognizing hey to err is human let's try to prevent and speak more openly so that we can prevent errors but also acknowledge them so that we can learn from our mistakes and not use shame and guilt uh, so there's been also a shift there And just accepting in general that from this infallible physician that was invincible to now accepting again, we are human and like anyone else, uh, we suffer, we are vulnerable to any kind of stress, infection, harm. Uh, And so we need to also practice more self-compassion, more self-care, putting that oxygen mask on. So those are principles now that that we're seeing shift and and where it's coming up in our language, it's coming up in our philosophy. So those are just examples of some of the the cultural shifts. And I have to say the younger generations of physicians are doing a great job at advocating and promoting those more current principles. So I think we really need to learn from them and be inspired by them. I think the self-care piece, you know, that's that's probably never going to go out of style, or at least I hope not. And it's really interesting to hear just how wild of a swing, you know, that culture shift has taken over the years from, you know, just being a terrible job to being the best job you can find. And then, okay, now the superhero complex side of things starts wearing off and, you know, the realities of burnout and overworking and work-life balance all start to kick in. And then, even more so, you know, when you think about it on the global context, you know, here in North America, it's still very that, you know, kind of superhero role, you know, very high, highly desirable job. But you go to other countries, you know, Europe in some many places, right? And it's it's less of that 
highly sought after more of a you know medium of the road paying job and you know seen more as just you know civil servant type of duty there's nothing super glamorous or glorious about it and can i add to that we saw it shift really rapidly as well during the pandemic if you remember early on in the pandemic people were with their pots and pans at 7 p.m to say thank you to not just physicians, the whole workforce, right, in healthcare. But very rapidly, when the pressures became bigger and bigger on the healthcare system, when it was harder for patients to be seen, um, access, right, to clinical uh, services were just getting harder and harder. And that anger quickly shifted the view of physicians from superhero really way down and it eroded a lot of trust, which I think is unfortunate and, and that we need to continue to work with patients to rebuild it. Uh, but you can see again how perceptions of physicians can rapidly shift according to the circumstances that, that we're, we're finding ourselves in. And so what kind of things should those physician leaders or you know people of any healthcare denomination and our allied healthcare team members what should those in that position of leadership really be considering or implementing or, you know, making sure they're walking the walk themselves? What kind of tips or tricks do you have there? Well, and this is partly based on my own experience over a decade ago at the Ottawa Hospital, um, where, you know, I would say for any group or any organization that just is looking for a place to start to improve physician wellness at their site, and as you've said before, to expand some of those principles for, for all staff as well. I, I would say the first step is leadership buy-in. You need the leaders to say, yes, this is important to us. We're willing to invest uh, and put time and energy into this. And then for leaders to designate an individual, someone who's passionate, who's interested in making a difference in physician wellness. So you identify a person to take this on. And that can be you know, a half day per week, uh, hopefully they're given protective time. Sometimes they start off volunteering, but essentially they do, they require and really deserve some type of compensation or protected time to do the work because it's so important. That assigned um, physician wellness leader or champion can then form a committee with representation from across the hospital, from different departments, uh, and ideally a committee that's diverse, um, and from there, what you do is you identify what are the key pain points that are really affecting physician morale, physician wellness. And that's how you can identify a set of maybe your top three or top five, five areas where you should uh, try to improve things or focus your initiatives. And a lot of the times when you ask physicians, like, what could be better uh, or what can make your wellness better? They'll say, just make it easier for me to come and do my job at work. You know, for me to be here to give good patient care, make my job easier. So when we surveyed our physicians at the Ottawa Hospital 10 years ago, they said, hey, if you gave me on-site access to a family doc, if you provided childcare for me, if I had better access to nutritious food, and if I could have maybe access to an exercise facility, that would really enhance my wellness. So they weren't asking for more counseling or psychology services. They were basically saying, make my work life healthier and better, and I will be able to feel better and, and provide better patient care. So what it did is it gave us a place to start as a committee and, and a place to start in terms of advocacy and building initiatives. So we created a strategic plan focused on those five areas with some outcomes, with who was the most responsible person. Um, and that's how we got to work. And we could not have done that without the full support and some funding from leadership, because it'll be great that like, you can have the best ideas in the world, but unless you have some funding, a little budget, support from leadership, you're not gonna go as far as, as you'd like. And involving the communications department was also really important to really make sure that everyone had easy access to information, to tools and supports in a, in a website, for example, or whenever we have uh, a letter coming from our CEO or our chief of staff, they blend in a component of wellness. So um, that's been really effective. So those are some of the steps. And you cannot forget measurement. 
I'm Dr. Jordan Valrath, and you've been watching Cherry Live, brought to you by Cherry Health. Please like and subscribe to see more clips like this, or check us out at www.cherry.health, Canada's medical network. Mm -hmm.